Steeler Nation, we are back for another great episode. The schedule was released. I am Jay York Football. This is Mike Up Sports One from sunny Fort Lauderdale, Florida. How are you today? Cheers, man. I'm I'm doing well. I'm thinking of cold Pittsburgh today in December. You're right, because after you look through that schedule, you start uh, penciling yeah. in like, hey, when do I want to come back for this game? And Christmas is on the schedule this year. I know we already touched on that a little bit, that home game mm-hmm. against Kansas City. So while it might be sunny down here, my brain is on on snow in Akershire Stadium uh, right now in May. <laughs> Yeah, did did you did you reactivate your Netflix account for the for the Steelers season? Because uh, you, you're you're probably going to want to have that. Just don't tell my sister. I'm still stealing her account. Okay. Um, and, I thought they I thought they were cutting back on that. <laughs> That's great. But hey, we have a really really special guest today, a Pittsburgher, um, South Hills legend. We we know Christian Coons. Well, this is the other South Hills legend. So what do you say, Juliana? We'll get to it and talk some Steelers football. Run it. Turn up your volume, because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast, Steelers Crazy. Harris Smith, Shields, Flacco, Polamalu takes it home, Super Bowl 43, Pittsburgh might be bound for that, thanks to number 43. The sickest Pittsburgh Steelers podcast. Sports entertainment like no other, it's gonna be sick. You said it, JY. This guy was a basketball player, analyst at Columbia. He's now doing that full-time for ESPN. Uh, Absolutely tremendous at it. Love watching this guy on television. But maybe most importantly, he is a native Yinzer and Steelers fan. Let's bring him on. It's none other than Dallin Cuff. Dallin, what's going on? Fellas, great to be with you. And that intro, that is the that's the pick that Troy made against the Ravens in the AFC championship game. Is that is that not? Because I could I go. was at a bar on 38th between 5th and Madison. Shout out to Butterfield 8. Used to house us a bunch of injuries, a bunch of animals. Party in the USA played afterwards. My boy James was dancing on the bar. Still can't get that image no. out of my head. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> but we did make a phone call right after that and went to that Super Bowl with my brother, one of our best friends, Murph. I'd met Murph. Those two dudes went to college there at that game. Seminal moment in our life. Obviously winning that game, watching Harrison at halftime run right past us and score a touchdown. I thought there was a penalty on the play. I was almost like not paying attention because I thought it was going to come back. But that day, now from that year, we've gone to a Steelers road trip every single year with those two dudes uh, since basically 2009. So life's changed. And it all started with that Troy play that kind of got it going. Oh, the first part of the set. What a does great still, set play. Does it still give you chills, goosebumps whenever you're, you, you hear that? I hadn't heard that call, like like that, that like call in forever. So that's like an interesting one that that's what you guys chose because – there are so many, whether it's Harrison's player, obviously the, when they want to know six, or you can have the call when, when Antonio makes San Antonio makes the catch. So there's all types of different elements you could throw in there to have that kind of be in your intro is interesting. And maybe I'm just also a TV nerd that I pay attention to that, but that's cool. Oh, me, we me appreciate too. It. Growing up, I didn't always watch the game. I was listening to Jim Nance on that call as well, thinking, all right, this is going to live forever because of how good the Nance call was yeah. um, as well, man. But, yeah, we're, we're excited to pick your brain a little bit, talk uh, Steelers and Yinzers. I, you know, obviously want to mention, first and foremost, that you're college basketball analyst, full-time ESPN. Another Yinzer, a lot of people in my ear saying, oh, you got you have Dallin Cuff coming on. Ask him about John Calipari. Ask him about what is going on. <laughs> what is going on there, Kentucky to Arkansas? Let, let's just get that out of the way. What was your first reaction when that happened? Uh, well, the Arkansas piece was a surprise. The relationship and the marriage um, had had run its course, let's just say, with Kentucky. Like, we kind of knew there was a, a, a potential divorce, but because, and if anybody's gone through divorce, uh, there is a legal matter there that which getting out of that is pretty pretty painful. Well, there was a lifetime deal and a huge buyout for, for Cal at Kentucky. So us in the media always thought, nobody's paying that, man. Like, this is not good, but I don't know how you get out of this. Well, how you get out of it is... I'm just going to leave. I'm going to leave the 30 plus million dollars. I'm going to go get paid a boatload at Arkansas somewhere else. Turned out to be Arkansas. Has great tradition. Obviously won a championship back in in the 90s and had been to they've been to two elite eights in the last five years. Two Sweet 16s. In addition to that, so they have tradition. They got a ton of money. They got a great arena. And now they got Cal, who uh, brings his own version of stuff down there. And he's not exactly a prodigal son of Pittsburgh. I feel like a lot of a lot of Yinders may not love him. I really want to claim him, but he still claims Pittsburgh. He loves to let people know. When they won the championship, he was claimed. Uh, 
Yeah. They're ousted in the first, first few rounds the last couple of years. Yeah. Maybe uh, left unclaimed. Jordan, I know you want to get into some more nuts and bolts. Go ahead. Yeah, so obviously uh, Russell Wilson, Justin Fields come to Pittsburgh. Uh, just kind of talk about, touch on that a little bit, your thoughts on that, and what what do you think the ceiling is, especially for Russell Wilson with him with his age. But uh, just, you know, I just think in Chicago personally, um, I just think Justin Fields was mismanaged. Um, so just kind of just shed light on that for us. Yeah, I don't know if my take jives with with, with Steeler Nation here, but I, I did not like the Russell Wilson move um, mm -hmm. for a number of reasons beyond the on-field production, which I question. Um, the more people we talk to that are around the game, he pre presents a great persona and says all the right things in the media. But when things are going south, is that the right guy in the locker room? Is that the dude that's, that, that you really want in a, w within that group? I'm not sure he is. I, I, don't, I don't see that. And I don't see him producing a ton on the field, so I think things could sour. And I would love to see Justin Fields get a shot, man. I think there's potential, there's upside. There's an, a we don't know and a potential future factor there. Like none of that really exists in the same level with Russell Wilson. It could be a short-term gap. And if I'm wrong and he plays well, that's great. But he's not going to be the guy doing it in three to five or seven years. If Fields does get a chance and performs, again, I wonder how that affects the locker room with Russell Wilson being there. And if he's if he's good, then obviously there's contractual things and how that may work with um, the fifth-year option stuff's coming up here soon. But they'll be. We can handle those questions. That's a great problem to have. If you actually yeah. are pushed to say, do we kind of have a franchise quarterback? Because for those of us that remember Bubby Brister and mm -hmm. Tim Hummels early and were alive in that period of time, and you know, you you, you had Neil O'Donnell, you had Patchwork, we Cordell, you love Slash, and he's under center. Mm -hmm. it's a revolving door. It's really hard to be great, and especially in today's NFL. Back then, you could still run the ball and play defense and find yourself in the AFC Championship game year after year and lose a number of them, but get but get through occasionally in '95. But like. That's different now. You need to have a quarterback. And the question is, we had Ben for a long time and took that for granted probably. And despite some of the issues around Ben, he got games, he got wins, and he got things done, and guys believed in him, and he can make plays. That's what you need in the NFL level. So if Fields could be that guy, I don't know. I, we know he's got a lot of talent, but there are a lot of other things to go into being a quarterback. I would love to see him and understand what he is about and what he could be in the future. And if not, we move on to something else. But I do not love that dynamic, and I do not love Russell Wilson being the guy for the Steelers or put in pole position for that job. An open competition would even be better to me to say, let's just look and see who's be who's better for this team right now and then also with an eye to the future. That's interesting, Dallin, because I think, you know, a lot of people have said, no matter what you start, Russell Wilson, because it's easier to transition to fields then if you fail as opposed to having him as a backup um, under fields. But – if Fields looks better than him in this preseason and commands the huddle, you know, better and, and his talents we see are on full display, reaching that ceiling we once thought he had, um, what would what would stop them from from just starting him off the bat? Well, I think the locker room situation that I'm that I that I think could be there, and that's the challenge. Um, and you wonder how a guy that's a future Hall of Famer and Russell Wilson has not handled some situations when things have not gone well, particularly well, and. Whether that's secluding himself from a team in past organizations, or we've read all the stories, we've talked. I've talked to a lot of people that have been around different organizations. Yeah. There's just a lot of questions there versus what the public persona is, but what actually happens in the building and what the guy is actually doing and how he's collecting, connecting, or coalescing with that locker room or not. And that's the question. So, yeah, if you give him the ball first and he fails, it's an easier transition. If Fields beats him out, quote unquote. A lot of that, guys, does happen in practice. I mean, preseason games aren't really telling you much, and I don't know how much you're really running either one we of them. We know right that. Now. We were we were crowned the preseason champs. We would yeah. like to forget that. Kenny Pickett's going to be the dark horse MVP terrible. candidate. Yeah, <laughs> I, feel like, I think I was on ESPN Bet Live the first week of the season. I'm beyond maligning Matt Canada. Just saying yeah. that this, this doesn't matter. Like, the preseason, it couldn't matter less. Like, yeah. and, the, and then once Steeler, once because obviously huge brand, Great franchise, fortunate to be a fan, and to grow up as a fan of a Steeler, like being mm -hmm. a Steelers fan, we are fortunate. We've had a ton of success. But that said, every people when they start to see things, they do create narratives, and they're we were leading all these national shows, but they're going to be the best best team of this and pick at this. Mm -hmm. For those of us to watch that offense and knew what was going on there, it seemed highly unlikely that this thing was somehow was going to turn around, and it, it turned out that way. But I remember being on that show, just being like, "This is." This stuff doesn't matter. It's it's what happens in the regular season and also what is happening in practice that we don't always see and we don't know what's really going on behind the scenes. So if Fields does beat him out, there's going to lead to a lot of questions, especially if Fields doesn't play well. To your point, then the media starts calling for this or the fans start calling for this. And then to have Russell Wilson sit on the sidelines and then come in, 
that dynamic could be corrosive. So yeah, I think likely Wilson is under center. I just would, I'm just more interested in seeing fields. Yeah, that's a, that's a good perspective. I, I've never really thought about it like that. And like I said, we'll, we'll never really know what goes on in that locker room. Um, we can only, you know, take stuff that we hear from the media. So that's, I think it's a good perspective. Um, so the schedule was released. Uh, I hope you, me and we were talking about it in the intro. We hope everyone has Netflix because it's like a bidding war with, with uh, now it's like you went from just having regular Xfinity Comcast and now you got to have every streaming spend a thousand dollars just to, you know, watch every uh, NFL game. But uh, we have a lot of holiday games. I think the Kansas city chiefs on Christmas, just talk about uh, some that uh, stick out. Um, and it seems like we have a pretty tough schedule. I think something came out on uh, NFL Fox that saying we were the third hardest schedule uh, in the NFL. So was there any games that you're kind of circling, uh, looking forward to? I think the whole schedule is a gauntlet, guys. I mean, you start three of the first four, you're on the road. Uh, I mentioned we go on that roadie. We're looking at Atlanta or Denver. So I'm, I'm going to yeah. be at one of those two games. Hopefully we're trying to figure that out. Uh, maybe Denver, given my work schedule. But um, when you look at that, three of the first four on the road, just from its entirety, in the last eight games, all six of the divisional games are then. Like, that's brutal when you think of how physical this division is how hard it is. And let's be real. Last year, we were pretty fortunate with how many backup quarterbacks we saw and particularly in division play, yeah. like going five and one in this, in this division is not likely, especially with the schedule. And then when you get down into another level within that last eight games, I think it's Ravens is it's, it's Ravens Cleveland on like a four day break. Yeah. And then Ravens chiefs on like a four day, like a four day break. Exactly. Do this Wednesday. We the, always the Thursday, Wednesday. I don't know brutal, why they that do is, that. that is going to be huge. So even if they start well, which is hard with three or four road games down the stretch is going to be an absolute nightmare. The Vegas over under for Steelers wins is seven and a half. I know a lot of my buddies want or have already hammered the over as a fan. You want that. I think we're in, we could be in store for a really hard year, not just because of a new offensive coordinator questions at the quarterback spot. We already put in there and talked about love the draft. Like we've done a free agency, but this schedule, it, I don't, I don't care why it says third. This is the hardest schedule beyond just opponent. Cause a lot of that comes from your opponent win percentage. We look at mm -hmm. opponent win percentage, the division, and then how the actual games lay out. Th there's nothing harder than this, especially down the stretch. It's, it's brutal. Yeah. Sandwich in there late is Philly as well. That's right. So it's yeah. not like it's division, division, uh, you know, Raiders, Chiefs. It's yeah. division, division, Philly, Ravens, four days rest, Chiefs. Yeah. That month in November looks the toughest, I think. Do we, I, I, do we have one home well, game? November is the start of the AFC North. So yeah, that's yeah. the start of that long AFC North. And this December is ridiculous because they have the the short time off. You know, we we have Jalen Warren come on with us during the season, Dallin. We well, ask he's about great. Him. I love him. Oh, he's the best. And uh, great on and off the field. And we at, we always ask these guys, like, you know, they, they want to keep it PC, obviously. Like, how do you feel about that four-day rest? And they, they don't keep it PC. They're like, it freaking sucks. They're like, I don't have time to recover. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm literally still, still sore from, from Sunday. And to have to do it twice in a four-week stretch against a physical team like Baltimore, first and foremost, um, and Kansas City, look at their defense as well, is is daunting. So Jordan, I, they're going to need – Jordan does some training over there on the side. They're going to need some IVs, some uh, – some yeah. all, all kind of PT stuff, right, Jordan? Jordan, didn't you say you were in a massage chair right now? Are you getting yeah. rubbed down as we do this? No, I, I wish I was. No, I'm just <laughs> using I'm just using the room as a podcast studio right now in in between training sessions. So that's that's what we're here. No to wonder see. you're so relaxed about the Steelers schedule. We're over here yeah. stressing. Well, I did just I did just I. take a flexibility class. I uh, taught a flexibility class, so that everything's feeling good. I'm nimble. I'm I'm ready to rock and roll. I'm ready to start the season right now. Um, but yeah, before I throw it back over to Mike, you kind of touched on it, but just talk about, you know, this Omar Khan era, you know, everyone, uh, the Khan artists, this and that, I don't care what you call them, but, uh, these last two drafts, um, he really did knock it out on the park, knock it out of the park. Uh, just kind of talk about that and then Mike, you can take it away. Yeah, he did an outstanding job and it's not sexy, but to take three offensive linemen in the, in the first five rounds, that's, that's a rare thing, but that's what this team needs. Like you, you need to have solidity, solidity in the offensive line to protect whoever the quarterback is. I think we always get obsessed with the quarterback, but if you don't have a line in front of him, you, you can't operate an offense kind of period. And we've seen that in recent years of, of having an offensive line that's been a bit of a sieve and that causes a huge problem. So I like what he did there um, in terms of going out, they getting a receiver, rookie receiver, very, I think he's could be really good down the road and maybe even right away, but they still need some help in the receiving area. And you got some guys coming in. I realize that we'll see how they fit into things. 
I actually liked him getting rid of DJ. I, 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 had, I had seen enough. And beyond just the, the clips that went viral, lack of effort. My man, if you're going to play like that, you got to catch everything in sight. Mm-hmm. Like from the actual performance and production standpoint, he had issues. So you couple that with effort and some some locker room stuff. It's just not a, we just not a Steeler guy. We're good. We'll just just move on to the to the next thing. So I think yeah. they made some good decisions there. Um, I, I like Willis uh, Wilson covering him and who did a lot of ACC work in the last couple of years and great kid and a hardworking kid that just got hosed with injuries. But you talk to anybody, any coach in the in the ACC, mm-hmm. like who's the best linebacker over the last couple of years? He's going to be right up there in the top three. And there's always said. Well, when he was healthy. So if he can stay healthy, I think you're going to have a pretty special player there. Um, Patrick Queen coming in is big. Jackson coming in is big. Uh, Dante Jackson, the cornerback. So there's they've done work in the free agency side of things. The draft was outstanding. Um, but I think it, I, I like what he's done. And he's upholding a tradition of excellence uh, from, from Colbert before that. Like there's been the front office the Steelers have, have put together and how they've evaluated talent, brought in players and developed players over the last 30 years. Is really second to none. It's like to me, it's almost like them and the Ravens. Really, when you look at, at how good it's been for so consists for so long over so many decades now, to put them in a position to win games and ultimately try to compete for championships. That's what we're trying to get back to, as we mentioned, as being spoiled Steelers fans. Mm-hmm. Like if we're not competing for AFC championships and Super Bowls, that's the standard, yeah. and that's unfortunately just not where we've been in recent years for a number of different reasons. Mm-hmm. We're not the Browns, Mike. No, no, we ain't. No, nah, we still we still find a way to beat on those guys, uh, even if Vegas will have them at what maybe eight and a half. Or they are they are they are one ahead of us potentially. Yeah. I think they are. Yeah, I'll, I'll take uh, I'll take under and over for Pittsburgh. Shocker, I know, but as recent history suggests, uh, could very well play out. But before we um, get out of here relatively soon, Cam Hayward wants uh, you know obviously we just reported yesterday that he wants a new contract, uh, likely going to hold out of OTAs probably. Would do it anyway. The guy deserves a break. He doesn't need to be out there. Um, you talked about guys who don't fit the Steelers' culture, like DJ, but obviously Cam Hayward is a guy that fits the mold. It's a Steeler guy, and that's where you, you get a lot of leeway from from me, and I think most fans. It's like, all right, you want to hold out, like you want to do what you what you think you deserve. I'll give you, I'll give you the power to do that. I mean, Heinz Ward's my favorite, you know, Steeler of all time. He went down the same path. I granted a while ago. Now, when you look at it in years, but. You, you know what you mean to the organization. You know what you mean to the city and the fans. You want to be compensated for that value. And I realize the Steelers have always been shrewd in their business approach where they don't tend to pay guys for past performance. But Cam can still play. And just like Heinz could still play. Like they, you can still play. And if you can still contribute on the field and off the field in the locker room, and obviously everything that Cam does in the, in the community is important, um, I, think it's, I think it's worth him doing what he thinks to get his value. I hope, the, they, hope they find a happy medium. Because in any negotiation, you're not going to get everything you want. But do you feel like you walked away being treated fairly? Do you feel like you've, you've got to walk away feeling good about it? If you walk away feeling poor about what happened, in his case, he's probably not going to sign. If he does sign, hopefully you're getting the same dude back. But that's where you want to, you want to do right by those that have always done right to you. At this level, I think that still applies. And for a guy like him, I have no ill will toward him trying to find, it, find a way to make sure that he secures his value because he's valued in so many different ways. Fair enough. We're hanging out with Dallin Cup here on the SICK Podcast Steelers. Crazy, of course, find him, College Basketball Live, ESPN Bet, among many other things. Last one for me before I kick it back to uh, JY over there. You said you've traveled for a bunch of Steelers games over the years outside of that Super Bowl we talked about in Arizona. What was one of your favorite experiences? Man, we've been to Arizona for a couple regular season games. Uh, we go to Miami. I feel like we've done we've had some bad losses in Miami. Too. So we walked out of Miami. Monday that was a, we also had the crazy win where Roethlisberger fumbled basically going to the yeah. end zone. But they – I don't even know what happened on the field because, you know, when you're watching the game, you're not really sure, like, what – the ruling made no sense. I remember walking out of there and saying to my brother at the, at the urinal, I feel like we stole something. And there was – and I'm 6'3", ah. and my brother's about the same height. So we're looking eye to eye, and there's a guy behind, between us. It's pretty short. He just goes, hey, buddy, shut the hell up. And I was like, <laughs> you know what? Fair enough. I'm not getting in a fight. I'm just, we're good. Do you, That's you know, fine. For you. Um, <laughs> yeah. We've had some good ones. I feel like that – that, the Miami trips are always fun. I'm trying to think of one. The one that's one of the most memorable, the most painful, was the loss of the Super Bowl in Dallas because they had that strike going on. Like, getting out of there was brutal. I almost bought a cab driver. It was not a pretty night. I ended up at a, at a Denny's at, like, 2.30 a.m. with a moons over my hammy bitching about life with my brother. 
Uh, it, was quite, it was quite a day. It was quite a night. Swiss cheese and, the, and, the, and you get the regular cheese. Man, that's a fantastic sandwich. And it was like freezing in Dallas for like the first time ever, yeah, right? It was not pretty. It was not, it was not, but it was memorable. And, uh, but it was not, but I actually, I made my decision to, to quit my advertising job and go into broadcasting there at that 2.30 a.m. dinner. So it was impactful in my life and a long uh, dinner, I guess, whatever you want to call it. Moons over my hand. It changed my life plenty of times after, after a long night of drinking. That's for sure. Jordan, go ahead. So before we get you out of here, just had to talk a little bit of college basketball, obviously. Just talk about what Jeff Cape has done in the past two seasons at Pitt, as well as obviously he's gone now, Keith Danbrock. But just talk about where, you know, Duquesne basketball is heading because it seems like they're trending in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, my parents both went to Duquesne. My pops played there in the 60s. Uh, eventually was drafted by, the, was drafted by the Knicks, but also drafted by the Army in the same two-week stretch. So the Army won that battle in 1968, wow. I guess it was. Um, but uh, – yeah, Coach Danbrot's done a great job, and I cover the A10. I do our Friday night package on ESPN, so I didn't got to go back to Duquesne for the first time ever as a broadcaster. I've awesome. covered that league for about eight or nine years, so it was cool to go back and to see a the new facility and see see Chuck Cooper the third and catch up with him and um, and kind of relive some old memories because it's the same plot of land at the Palumbo Center. It's the same thing; it's just rebuilt. Yeah, so that was cool. Um, and Coach Danbrot did a phenomenal do- job, kind of building that program and and now turning it to, to Coach Joyce. I think. There's there's higher heights to go, but I think they can get to that facility. Really does help them. It's 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 a best in class facility. I think that you need to continue to find a find a way to recruit uh, more broadly than than the recruiting base that is sometimes was hard about Western Pennsylvania. There aren't a ton of Division One players that come out of there, so it's hard to recruit to that area. So you got to be a little creative. You got to do well in the portal, and I hope he can hope he can do that. As I said, obviously a soft spot for Duquesne. And what Coach Capel's done has been great, and I do commend the the, the administration there of sticking with him. Uh, he's a great coach that had to kind of find his footing. And again, find your players, find how to b- balance the transfer portal, get different dudes in there. And two years ago, they were able to get to the tournament and realize, you know, show the country some of their potential or some of their talent. This year, um, the final 10 games, of the NCAA of the college se- basketball season as a football podcast used to be a metric for determining if you go to the tournament or not. It's not anymore there. It needs to be implemented because we're putting so much weight on what happens in November, and December teams like Pitt. I was just, I was telling coach Capel this two weeks ago. I was texting with him. They deserve to be in the tournament like that. They were left out. And that's not like a bias from a Pittsburgh guy. Mm-hmm. I just told you, I'm a Duquesne guy. Right. That team right. was improving and playing well. They needed to have an opportunity to showcase that on the highest level. There were other teams like Virginia, also in the ACC, who was playing horrifically. that didn't earn it to get there at the end of the season. I want the best teams playing in March to be in that tournament. And that, I think Pitt showed that and didn't have that opportunity. So I'm excited to see where he's going again. He's getting he, losing some very talented players. One you know, freshman going to the draft. But there's other... Or could be going to the draft, I should say. It's not guaranteed, but um, but you have he's gonna he's done a great job in the portal. He's done a good job with freshman recruiting. He's a good coach. Um, and I'm excited to see where they can keep building within a league that's not as top heavy as it once was. And they've shown they can get there. I mean, two years ago they should have they had a chance to win the yeah. league uh, two seasons ago and on the final day of the season. So I think he's shown it, and I'm glad the administration is stuck with him and excited about the future. Hey, Amen. Right. Who cares yeah, about I a think, loss in Missouri yeah. in November? And bring and, and and on that note, bring back the city game. Yo, that's I mean, what I don't understand like how that goes away. This is crazy. It somebody was so good. Somebody sent me this. Um, I got I'm fl- blanket on his name, but he reached out on social media. And long story short, he sent me this like Pittsburgh sports care package, but it had the 1963 uh, the, the the Duquesne Pitt game, the Steel Bowl was it called it. Mm-hmm. Like they had that my dad played it. Like he sent me this DVD, so I had it digitized, so I would be able to like watch cool. in back time this black, like yeah. black and white film of like my dad at twenty two or twenty one playing. Like it was, it was crazy. Like there's a lot of history in that game. That's that game was one of the games I grew up watching. We go to the Civic Arena every year and watch that game. Um, so yeah, I really hope that they they find a way to put that back on the map because I know scheduling is tough. I know there's a lot of challenges, but the city kind of needs it. Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, needs, it. It. Pittsburgh yeah. needs it. Yeah. Hey, it, it's been great talking to you. We appreciate your time. Uh, just tell everyone what you got coming up next and where they can find all your work. Well, I'm having a baby about eight days. I'm not. My yeah. fiance is. So, th- so we're doing that. Congratulations, um, Congrats, man. <laughs> so we're uh, so a lot of that going on. But um, so we'll be doing a little less work here in June. But I'm always on SiriusXM channel 84, um, the College Sports Channel 371, ACC channel. But obviously ESPN. Uh, ESPN Bet Live, ESPN, ESPN College Basketball. We call our soccer games as well on ESPN up and through the championships. So we're doing a lot of that. Oh, and F1 coverage. So a lot of F1 stuff. Um, we don't, I think the next race in the States is in October in Austin. I'll be there for that. But yeah, it should be a little bit more of a relaxed summer, at least on the work side. And then we get back into things heavy. Girl, girl or boy, 
You know, we don't know, baby. We'll know when that thing comes flying into the world. But either way, the name's got to be Paul Amalu, right? (laughs) Dude, I love that guy. I love that guy, but I don't think I'm selling uh, to a girl from Charleston, uh, Paul Amalu. (laughs) Troy, maybe. Paul Amalu might be a stretch. Fair enough. Fair enough. (laughs) Roethlisberger will do it. (laughs) Hey, we really appreciate your time, man. It's been a pleasure. Great to be here, man. Thanks for tracking me down and patience and scheduling, man. A lot of fun to be on with you guys. Thank you. Go Steelers. Yeah, it's great, man. You you had a chance because you have a you you have a daughter and she's relatively newborn. You could have gone, yeah. you know, you could have gone uh, James Harrison Farrier. Could have threw a uh, you know one of those names out there. Our buddy Matt Mike. I'm gonna be seeing him soon. He named his uh, yeah. He literally just texted me. Shout out Matt Mike. His daughter Crosby. Yeah. He usually with always a K, was. with a K with a K as Sydney Crosby right there. So. It just yeah. goes to show how uh, Pittsburgh sports transcend generations. That's for sure. But no, I think Aria is a beautiful name, and I, I, I think Alyssa would not have gone for oh. for like Diesel. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Hey, it's been a great show, man. It's just always good to have you know a Pittsburgher, but just everything that he accomplished, and I, I could tell that uh, you know just he really enjoyed it, and, and as we did, so. Yeah, we're just going to keep it rocking and rolling 365 days a week of Steeler coverage. We appreciate everyone tuning in. I'm Jay York Football. This is Mike Up Sports One from sunny Fort Lauderdale. And uh, until next time, here we go, Steelers. The season is approaching. Juliana, take it away. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the sick podcast Steelers Crazy on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.